Good morning, my name is Roseanne West, and what I will be dis uh, describing this morning for you is my capstone on the Emergency Discharge Education Resource Program. And what this program encapsulates is characteristics of Malcolm Knowles' andragogy principles of adult teaching. It also encompasses uh, benefits of humor within teaching and in nursing education, and it also encompasses the utilizing of, of a flipped classroom teaching technique. Why this is so important is that, that education, predominantly um, hospital discharge education, has become of national prominence because of intense utilization um, and the uh, ever, ever increasing utilization within the emergency departments. What is exacerbating this need for uh, critical um, education is the, uh, the Obamacare Act of 2010, the Affordable Care Act, which more people are now have access to insurance so therefore they're utilizing um, services predominantly in the emergency room. So what this program is, it's specifically designed for emergency nurses to um, obtain better competency and confidence in adult education. As I mentioned, the emergency department utilization has increased 23% over the past 10 years. Again, with um, Obamacare, uh, what has happened, it has increased the Medicaid rolls by 16 million, up to 60 million Medicaid recipients nationally. It's also incurred more people who are still uninsured or not able to obtain insurance. That's roughly 46 million nationally. So these folks, there's no place for them to go. Primary care has decreased uh, in access. They've also limited their practices to these, these certain types of insurances, the Medicaid, and the uninsured because they cannot be reliant on the large population base of those two insurances. So with their limited access, um, also with federal legislation, the MTELA laws and the COBRA laws, emergency departments cannot turn anyone away. They must render a medical examination and so therefore utilization has increased dramatically. The complexity of the diagnoses, the complexity of the acuity has really enhanced the need for accurate and appropriate adult education. Um, and many of the nurses, as I'll explain later on in some of my slides, uh, just do not have the competence, they don't have the education themselves to render appropriate adult education. Many of the, um, the literature that I had uh, come, come to learn is that there's extreme benefits of humor along with education, it helps with retention and reduce anxiety which I'll get into, but predominantly what I'd like to show is that the emergency room use has increased greatly over the past 10 years, 23%, and predominantly by people 20 to 40 years age, that, that age group for some reason um, is increasing. Um, this is um, a graph that we, was put together by the CDC showing that this is all under age 65, so these are non-Medicare folks. There's been the yellow is private, the blue is Medicaid, and the green is uninsured. As you can see in the 18 to 44 group, you can see the largest amount of increase across all types of insurances utilizing the emergency room. Again, no access with the Medicaid population. There's no co-pays, so why not? They can go anytime they want, not have to worry about access. Um, the greatest increase that um, Dr. Tang and her colleagues found in their research um, was in, again, this age group, and it started in 2010 and has steadily increased since then. This was a very interesting slide as well. This shows the amount of, 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 edu of, medic of, excuse me, of emergency room visits for preventable situations. This is private insurance. This is the uninsured. This is Medicaid. So for every 1,000 Medicaid beneficiaries, 84 of them use the ER for preventable visits. As compared to the uninsured, which is 23 for every 1,000, and for the private insurance, every 12 for 1,000. And you have to remember, the Medicaid enrollment has escalated to 60 million. And out of that, 84 people out of that every 1,000 utilize the ER repeatedly for situations which could very readily be handled in either an urgent care, uh, a walk-in, or the primary care office. So the Medicaid um, utilization 
is four to times eight greater than the privately insured or the uninsured. So why did the, the focus on the education? As I mentioned, the ER nurse has a daunting task of conducting accurate and appropriate discharge education in a very limited time, in a very non-conducive non environment. Just think of yourselves, if you've been to the emergency department, is it really a good, good place to get education? I mean, it's, you, the administration is looking through throughput, which is as time you uh, enter the door, time to your disposition, door to doctor, door to triage, door to disposition, constantly looking at those times. So you're under a lot of stress to get the patient in and out as fast as possibly you can. Um, the RNs need to understand the premise of adult education. They need to understand how humor can assist them in rendering appropriate adult education. Why is that? Because it helps reduce barriers. Um, Campbell and Bell did some research with some nurses, registered nurses across nationally, and asked them regarding what their feelings were doing education, predominantly with adults. The number one barrier that was identified in this research was lack of education. We ourselves as nurses, think about, be back to your nursing training, did you receive training on education and how to appropriately, how adults learn and the techniques and teaching strategies? Not many have. Um, lack of uh, time was another one. Lack of confidence and lack of, of, of competence were the three big barriers that many of the nurses identified in Campbell and Bell's research. Um, this, uh, one of our authors of our textbooks, Nurses Educator uh, Estavo, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, I love the quote. It's a very powerful quote. The single most important action of nurses as educators is to prepare patients for self-care. And that's what we as emergency room nurses and any type of nurse, whether it's an ICU or a unit nurse, what we have to do is ascertain the best way to get the information across to the adults and also ascertain whether or not humor is more appropriate to utilize. And I'll get into what I mean by humor edu education. Um, we real the program was developed in response to a need to address adult technique, understanding humor, how to apply the humor, and how to um, gain confidence to do so. So my theory for the program, one of the premises uh, of the program is adult theory, how do they learn, humor, the benefits, and using tenets of a flipped classroom teaching strategy technique. Those are the three main tenets of my program that I developed. And of course, Malcolm Knowles, he is the uh, developed andragogy, which has six main principles. Um, and utilize, I think this, this type of teaching strategy also supports uh, the util utilization of humor very well. Um, this, this strategy also resonates Carl Rogers, the psychologist, his theory of student-centered education, where we facilitate learning. Learning is bi-directional, we facilitate learning. And we learn also that, that adults learn through self-maintenance, and adults learn when there's no threat to self. That's what's Carl Rogers' theory, and I think that applies very appropriately and resonates very clearly with Malcolm Knowles' andragogy. Um, it also allows flexibility to adjust to learner facilitator need. There's not just one model, one cookie cutter that we apply to everyone. We have to be very flexible. We have to be able to understand their need. We have to be able to meet their need, and we have to be able to modify our teaching techniques to address that need. And that's what andragogy allows. It really allows the fostering of that learning relationship. I'll get this right. By the end of the last slide, I'll get it right. <laughs> These are the six principles, which I'm sure we're all very familiar with, but, uh, of andragogy. The need to know is to comprehend, why do I need to know this information? Self-concept is the feeling of the self and self-responsibility for learning. The foundation, the very key, is acknowledging the person, the adult's past experiences, their, and their past um, experiences and knowledge that they have. The readiness, we have to be able to, again, these are the six principles of andragogy, these are what the nurses need to be, uh, be aware, aware of, is their readiness to learn. 
Are they ready? Are they just so in such a state of denial or anxiety and fear that they are not ready to learn at all? Motivation intrinsically. What is it good for me? Why is this good for me to learn this information? Do I have the motivation and the intrinsic drive to learn this information and to understand it? And the orientation is associated is the oriented with their current life situation. So these are the six main principles of andragogy that the program will stress to the nurses participating in the program. All right, Roseanne, we can get this right. And as I mentioned, it is coupled with humor, humor-infused education. We as nurses have both informal and formal conversations with our patients. You can learn a lot from their verbal and their nonverbal cues back. So that's why I stress bi-directional learning. It is not this. We're together and we're learning constantly. Each time you interact with a patient, each time you, you, you educate a patient, you will learn a better way of how to handle, how to understand their need, and how to address the need. Humor, the definition of humor is elusive. It's very individual. What I find humorous, Mary Beth might not have found humorous at all. So that is another thing that the program will over, go overview is what humor is and what would be the best way to apply it to the situation. It doesn't mean downing on a clown nose and a clown wig and, and, and doing the soft shoe into the room. It could be a smile, a wink, a quick little joke. It could be, it's very individualistic and it's very flexible to the situation. It also, um, interestingly enough, through my literature review, Freud was mentioned quite a bit in utilizing humor. And what he found, it was a transformation of psychic energy from negative psychic energy to positive. And it also gave the ego the upper hand over the superego and the id. I thought that was very, very interesting. And what it does is it bridges the rapport, it helps develop the rapport with the patient immediately. As an emergency room nurse, I have very, very little time. I can't sit down and have a cup of tea with everyone and find out their past history. I have a couple, I have maybe a couple minutes to go into the room, get to know the patient, understand their needs. Only their medical needs? No. The whole patient, but their emotional needs, knowledge needs are. And that breaking a joke, telling a, a smile, a wink, a quick little laugh. I can't tell you, goes a long, long way. To give you an example, um, it's we, with female patients, we always have to ask, is there any chance of a pregnancy uh, under a certain age, like say under 50, we ask. And this one lady looked at me and she goes, oh honey, the playground's gone, but the slide is still there. <laughs> and from that, and it was, I had the best interaction with that patient after that. We had a wonderful education, discharge education session. She actually read the information. She asked me questions. Um, and she definitely comprehended the information. And humor was the gateway. Humor also, tech, also uh, develops a therapeutic communication. Does anybody remember what therapeutic means? As nurses, we're always taught about therapeutic communication, right? Yes, nod your heads, yes. yes. Therapeutic, de by definition, is the physical and emotional well-being of a patient. So in order for us to be able to educate to their self-needs, to have them retain and understand and make sure that it's a therapeutic relationship, humor along with the appropriate education technique is the positive answer for us. And if anybody has any questions along the way, please stop me. Otherwise, I'm going to be rambling up a storm here. Humor in nursing education, along with in humor and in healthcare, um, it addresses the self-care deficit, as you know, Dorothy Orm, she's another one of my theorists that I felt was very important to the program, is that many people uh, have a self-care deficit. That's why they're there in the emergency room. There's a reason why they can't take care of themselves or they no, doesn't know what quite's going on. So we're able to uh, address their self-care deficit, and education is such a key. And what the humor is going to do, it develops that rapport, as I mentioned before. It's going to understand, it's going to help the patient understand some very difficult information. It's going to bridge that social distance. Uh, I'm a stranger to them. They don't know me. I don't know them most of the time. And they're going to, and even just the, the, 
the physical. They're laying in the stretcher and I'm standing up. There's, so, there's, there's physical difference, there's social differences. They perceive the person as the highly educated person. If you start being very, very down to earth, very humanistic with humor, it makes them very much more comfortable, they'll open up to you more, they'll respond to you more appropriately. Um, it's, a, it's a social, it, it, it balances the social inequity that the patients perceive, it makes us more equal. Uh, again, it's a therapeutic commission tool. And it also enhances student satisfaction, student retention of information, and student retention of very difficult topics. Can you think back to your lectures where there was something that the, the, the professor was going over that was very, very difficult? For me, the, when I was initially introduced to arterial blood gas results, remember those? Those are very difficult to understand. Can you imagine that, that lecture, but with a little bit of humor infused? It has found that students will retain much more difficult information. And why I put this, this graphic up is what do you think his, his psychological, here we go, Mary Beth would probably do this in a heartbeat. It says um, boo boos and sniffles versus urgent care. It should have, say, emergent care over there. Is, so to me, it's urgent. A lot of patients coming into the emergency department, to them it's an emergency, it's a crisis. I'll look at them and say, really? You know, but I can't say that to them, that, but that would totally destroy my re relationship with the patient. We have to, now, do you think this is a teachable moment right now? Do you think he'd listen to anything I had to say? In his mind, this is a crisis. I need to be seen, I need to be seen urgently. Doesn't understand that there's a code going on in the next room and that's where the emergency position is. Um, and it takes, and so my initial interface with this gentleman, I would definitely see where I might be able to use a little humor. Again, not doing the soft shoe, not doing slapstick. Something he might stay, say, I, I can grasp onto and turn it into a more uh, non-threatening situation. So again, I did the, 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 the EDER program, Emergency Discharge Education Response Program, um, was developed to address the need. It was developed um, at understanding the young adults, 20 to 40 year olds, because of their utilization is, is the highest in the, in the past five years. It would be an annual training for the EDRNs. It would focus on Malcolm Knowles, Andrew Goji Six Principles. It would focus in on uh, which I won't get into, Vera Robinson and her the use of humor in healthcare education. And but also what I envision it to be a two hour training session face to face, utilizing flipped classroom technique, and then um, having management participate in the program as well. And they would appro appropriate shift champions, as I call them, one per shift, who would help develop and serve as a mentor and guide for the rest of the RNs regarding the education regarding the use of humor, maybe even put some humor resources together, comics, funny little things to put together to help the nurses have a better comfort level. As I mentioned, the EDR nurse, because we have so many roles and, and so many different demands made upon us. I, I, I personally gravitate to this one many times, you know, with my cape on flying through the ER, trying to do, handle six, seven patients in the five ambulances that are coming in. Uh, very little time to do a great deal amount of work. So that's why you have to have a greater knowledge of a, a adult tasks, adult education roles, a great, how do they learn, and be able to implement it quickly and succinctly. So with any program, you need to conduct a needs assessment. Why do we need a needs assessment? Why do you need to conduct a needs assessment? Anyone? Bueller. <laughs> okay. You didn't think I'd be asking questions, did you? Obviously, you got to. You have to find. You have to know what your target population is first. What's your population? Then you got to determine what needs there are. What's their basic? What's their foundation? Where do the Where do the deficiencies lie? Then you need to gather, analyze the learning organizational need, and you have to look at perceived need versus actual need. And again, perceived need is that based upon the senses versus actual need is based upon fact. And um, uh, I proposed using um, Mr. Stedman's, who was a training developer, 
uh, informal observation and informal conversation. These are the two ways which I conducted my needs assessment. And why that is, is informal conversation, informal observation was non-invasive. I stood back and I kind of listened to my colleagues doing their educational piece at discharge. And then afterwards, I would talk to them informally, uh, have an informal conversation with them to see how things went, what went well, what didn't go well, what would they have done better, what would they have done differently. And it really led to a lot of very interesting uh, information. So Mr. Stedman felt that um, informal observation, along with informal conversation, would give you the most accurate, accurate need that, of that population. I thought that was very interesting. And you're like, keep going, Roseanne. We want to get up there and do our presentation. <laughs> I really put these two, these two pictures together. For such, there's such a stark difference. Look at this one over here. This is us, smiling, laughing. This, this exemplifies Malcolm Knowles' principles. We have motivation, we have intrinsic need, we have self-concept, um, we have flexibility, we have humor. We want to be there, we're ready to learn, we're, it's two-way directional learning. Um, it's just, it's, I learned, you know, the professor learns from them, they learn from the professor. There may be initial intent, but it might, the needs might uh, change throughout the, uh, the program. And then I found this picture, circa 1949. Look at the stark difference. You have, I mean, just look at the, the physical. Um, the first thing I saw, what I thought of when I saw this one was conformity, rigidity. Um, I thought, I just wanted to show how with Malcolm Knowles and his principles and along with humor, and along with the flipped classroom was such a stark difference to this point. Do you think they have any say in what they learn? I think that's, I thought it was such an interesting, interesting uh, photograph. Okay. So with the, as I mentioned before, you, you observe, you gain the knowledge, it leads to some, some programs or to the reality of it all. Uh, my colleagues felt that there was an indifference to patients with their education. They just wanted to get out of their ED. They did not want to stay. Uh, they were not certain on the best way to educate the adults. They had a very uncertainty level. Again, that confidence level wasn't there. The definitely reduced lack of time. A great deal of, of that came across very loud and clear. And reduced sense of, ur of an urgency for efficient discharge education. They're like, Many of my colleagues would just, some of them would take the discharge, which is a paper that we have to hand out, say, here's your discharge information, good luck, feel better. They didn't understand why it's so urgent, why you need to explain and make sure that there's some comprehension so that they, in turn, the patient can gain some knowledge to address their self-care deficit and to not have a return visit back to the emergency room. Uh, so this is why... Um, they really needed the educational skill. Many of them uh, are very humorous with their colleagues, but I've never seen many of my colleagues be humorous with patients. Some of them don't feel comfortable. And again, with my ER, just to give you an example, the age, the, uh, there's a vast age difference, uh, a vast experience difference. Some of them are uh, nurses are five years. Some of we span up to 40 years of nursing experience. You've got ICU experience, oncology, cardiology experiences. So there's a different level within each nurse. And what I hope the program would help to do is that they have a better comfort level with utilizing humor, understanding their humor within themselves and how they can relate that to the patient. So that's what was another focus of, of my program. Flipped classroom te uh, technique. This is the, would be the third aspect of the EDER program. Uh, why I felt this, I think it fell very well in place with Malcolm Knowles' theory, Carl Rogers' theory, and uh, Vera Robinson's theory of humor-infused education. There's three tenets or three main aspects of the flipped classroom. There are uh, activities before you even get to the class. What that entails is a 20 to 30 minute video that's done by the professor that's available online for the students to review one week prior to the lecture and they can review it as many times as they want. 
there's an online quiz, there's an online reflective journal, and then there's like an online blog where students can converse with one another to help them understand the concepts, and there's also text reading as well. That's all done prior to class by the student. It gives the student focus, it gives them accountability, and it gives them hopefully a greater understanding of all the concept before number two, they get into the class. And the activities that are done in classes, there might be a quick five, 10 minute review of all the pre-class activity. And then in-class activities include adult, um, excuse me, individual presentations, group presentations, case studies, um, journal review, journal critiques, and any other um, activities deemed appropriate by both student and professor. So that's in class. And then you have after class, which is prep for your individual presentation, your group presentation, uh, prep for group study, whatnot. So, and this is cyclic. And then before the next class, they have another video, another online quiz, another online uh, self-reflective journal. So this is repetitive throughout the semester. So what are the advantages of flipped? Why, do you, why did I choose flipped over any other type of teaching methodology that we removed over the past 17 months? Um, the, uh, the EDR program is going to use some aspects of the flipped. It's going to use um, videos within class. It's going to use individual presentations. It's going to do uh, group presentations. And it's also going to be doing a little bit of gaming as well, too. That's going to uh, help with peer-to-peer uh, -peer interaction, problem solving. It also uh, lends itself to better engagement between the students and the facilitator. Just many, many positives uh, for this. Um, the individual presentation supports that individual content. You yourselves, think about what a presentation like today. You really have to know your content, really have to know the knowledge behind it. And think of all the prep work. So the, what, what these, I don't know if you can't read these, are kind of a little, little fuzzy when I blew up the slide. It promotes peer interaction. It promotes higher student engagement, as I mentioned before. The learning is central. There's also independent learning versus group learning. And it also offers individualized attention. If the professor sees from those online quizzes that someone is just not grasping the concept, they in turn can set up a one-on-one. -on -one. They can try, I don't they can also try a red where they can do online, you know, emailing or texting back to one another, or they can do a one-to-one face-to-face -to, -face to help the student gain better knowledge of that content or that specific content. And those videos are available throughout the semester, so they can always go back and review those videos if necessary of the lecture. Okay, yeah, we'll get this in. So all right. So like again with any program, you need to do the needs assessment, develop what your needs are, develop your plan. Very similar to what the nursing process is, right? We assess the patient, we diagnose the patient, we plan, we implement, and we evaluate, right? Same thing in developing an education program. And so what the next session is, the next part is, is how do I know it's effective? Did I develop the right thing? Is my lesson plan appropriate? Do I need to make modifications to meet my goals? of helping these nurses understand adult education, feeling comfortable with adult education, and doing it in a humorous manner that they feel comfortable and is appropriate with the patient as well. So I did, um, um, I did a lot of research, and there was a lot of information about um, flipped classrooms. Um, I did a Google Scholar EBSCO search. You can do flipped classroom, inverted classroom, student-centered classroom. Those are some of the key terms that I utilized. There was a great deal of information regarding flipped classroom, and the flipped classroom tech, um, strategy has been utilized since 1990. It has been utilized in various educational formats. It's been used in grade school, high school, undergrad, graduate, and post-professional schools as well. So there's a full gamut from which, the, and, and various tenets thereof. Um, there were three, effect, uh, three tools, again, um, you have your formative and your summative evaluation. As you know, formative is during the class, summative is status post completion of the class. And so there was very limited information on appropriate tools to, uh, to develop whether or not if your, your flipped classroom technique is effective enough. 
And there were three that I found. Um, as you can see, uh, Dr. Edwards did a flipped classroom in uh, a pharmacy, school of pharmacy. Ms. Ledeen and her colleagues did one within a, a baccalaureate program. But they, these two were very, very limited. Very limited research, very limited data. What I found was Professor Strayer and his tool, he is a mathematics professor, and he implemented a flipped classroom technique in his statistics classes. Can you imagine that? And believe it or not, and what, what he did, he did a formative and he did a summative, and the summative evaluative tool was a, was a questionnaire that had both quantitative and qualitative information by the students. And what he found is that the students retained this very difficult topic. Uh, they had higher grades, and they just said it on average they were higher, and that he, the comprehension of this very difficult information was, was demonstrated through his research. So from, from his, this information, I, um, I developed one specifically for the EDR program, which I'll get into momentarily. The literature review regarding humor in healthcare. Uh, one of these days, I'm going to dress like that and go to work, and just to see what would happen. <laughs> one of these days. One of these days. Love this one. Um, as I mentioned before, there's so much that humor, and it doesn't mean that the professor has to stand up in full clown garb. It just could mean some uh, cute comic strips uh, up on the on the slide a couple of jokes. Sometimes you can just ascertain what like a patient, like what that patient said, the playground's gone, but the slide is still there. You can imagine what her and I were joking about afterwards. And we had a wonderful interaction. Reduction of fear, anxiety, stress. Enhances retention. Reduces boredom of lectures. Students are more engaged with the professor. Students also saw the professor as someone of more humanistic, believe it or not, where, they, again, the social distance is, and social barriers are, are diffused. Uh, again, there was questionnaires that were conducted after. This was in uh, schools of nursing, I believe it was baccalaureate programs, where they found the students were happier, the students were more satisfied with the class, the students were comprehended better, um, and they just felt an overall positive experience when the professor was found to be humorous, uh, was seen to be uh, much more interactive with the students. There was better bi-directional flow of information, more questions asked. It just opened up and facilitated the learning all the way around. And um, it got along, again, with Dorothy Orham and, and her theory. She said that the nurses do their best, greatest empowerment through teaching. And education, as we know, is a major aspect of the nursing process. Just think of how many times you folks, we have to educate patients or colleagues in that matter. So they really need to understand, I think the ER, what the ERED program is going to stress is, again, the benefits of utilizing humor, what humor means to them as an individual, and the benefits of it when you utilize it in combination with um, Andrew Knowles' Andrew Gochi principles. Basically, I just wanted to share with you some of the, I felt was very, very uh, appropriate um, literature review on um, education, both in uh, humor and education, and humor in healthcare education. Um, as we mentioned, I already told you about Dr. Freud. I thought he was very interesting. Bennett is Dr. Bennett. He is a pediatrician. He's the one, he strongly supports humor with patients because he found it enhances therapeutic communication. Uh, Ms. Buxman, she is a professor of nursing. She's also a professional speaker. She goes around the nation talking about how humor enhances teaching skill. Uh, Engelhart also is a professor of nursing. And she found that, uh, it also again, therapeutic communication once again. And also she found there's lasting effects with the retention of the information. The people gain information, they gain skill, and they, uh, they're able to maintain or enhance their lifestyle from that from that benefit. Uloff also, she is a professor, and she found about the reduction of boredom, the retention of information, and the reduction of stress and anxiety. And then Vera Robinson, I think she's my hero. She is a professor of nursing. She's also a, was a nurse researcher, 
she is the one that felt it was the most positive, effective teaching tool within the healthcare setting. Her book is wonderful. And then along with the flipped classroom tenants um, is, was how I actually sat down and finally put the EDR program together. Um, I love this quote. I think you learn more if you're laughing at the same time. Think of it yourself. Think about some lectures or some classes that you've gone through. And if the, if the professor was seen as a very staunch, remember that 1949 picture of the staunch nurse and her star, starched whites and her cap and everything, and her hands are down to her side like this. I just, just uh, absolute non-interaction. Uh, but I, Mary Ann Schaefer is an American writer, editor, and a librarian who wrote several books. Um, and I just thought that quote was just tied in so very nicely. <clears throat> so, what is my philosophy, mission, and goals for the program? Not to bore you, but basically nursing is a lifelong learning. It's also supported through the... Uh, um, IOM's uh, report on nursing. Um, the specific uh, goal is the future of nursing, leading change in advancing health. I think we've all been exposed to that report where it stresses higher level of learning for nurses. It also stresses lifelong learning for nurses. Um, you know, back to the Lord, to masters, masters to doctorate. Uh, it's, as we continue to learn, we will be more beneficial for our patients and our, and, um, our colleagues. Um, what I wanted to do is I want that therapeutic aspect to come through loud and strong uh, so that our, my colleagues feel, and any EDR nurse feels more com comfortable with that capability. Um, educator excellence. Remember Campbell and Bell's research felt that nurses didn't feel they had the capability or the skill to do appropriate education. So I want to build their confidence and teach them the basic tenets of adult learning theory. My vision is to make sure that they're maintain their individualism, to maintain their integrity, but also to promote a learning and teaching environment within the, the emergency room, which really is, is challenging within an emergency room setting. Yay, I did it right finally. Ooh. <laughs> some of the objectives that I put together, some specifics, as I mentioned before, they're gonna know what an adult is. This program's gonna focus in on the 20 to 40 year old range and how they learn. They uh, were identified as one of the most teachable or learn, learnable um, population because they want to either maintain or they want to enhance their lifestyle. So they were the most teachable. So we'll start with them and then we'll get into the, to the other sniffling 60-year-old guy that I showed before. I want them to be able to understand Malcolm Knowles and Andrew Goji principles, those six main principles, be able to rattle them right off, be able to utilize them when they can. And I also want them to understand the one of the objectives is to understand the benefits of humor and how they can, what humor is and how they can, excuse me, apply it most appropriately. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm also promoting uh, shift champions, uh, but they would be able to help each of the nurses, help them recognize teachable moments, help them to be able to recognize which undergoing principle would be most appropriate and if humor is brought. Sometimes humor is not appropriate in, in an emergency room. Can anybody think of a, an, a one aspect where humor would not be appropriate to utilize? What's that? Codes. Codes. Yeah. Another one is um, fetal demise would be another one. So a certain, so a nurse has to be realized, has to realize, obviously, you know, but, but there could be others as well. Um, that the person's just not, just got, has shut down for whatever reason with the diagnosis that they've gotten. Um, they have just shut down. You could, you could jump up and down and turn blue. They're not going to notice you. So. And that's not a failure. It's a, the ability to recognize that there's just, we just not going to be able to, to educate everyone. There are going to be those folks that no matter what we do, what we try to do, they cannot be educated at that time. So what, how, again, the key to any program, you have to uh, be able to ascertain the effectiveness. Uh, so what I have done is I've developed two tools. One of them, uh, part of the program is, the, is that each person would stand up and give a quick presentation on one of the andragogy principles that they've picked out. 
Uh, so there's a peer checklist that I developed. So uh, as that peer is standing up talking about, say, intrinsic factor, uh, the peer, their, his peers or her peers would do a checklist to ascertain whether or not they, they hit the key points that they felt was appropriate. My other one would be, so that kind of be like a formative situation. The other one is a, a summative questionnaire at the end, of both qualitative and quantitative information. And then that information I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting would then be um, tabulated by the hospital quality assurance software program. And then that information reviewed by myself and the management and then, then we would make necessary program enhancements as well. And now, you know, Dr. Burke felt that uh, there's two things that really supplement the, the key to effective uh, evaluation, effectiveness of a program. Um, he felt that questionnaires in combination with peer evaluation would offer the most truthful aspect of, of the program. So that's why I went with both the peer review checklist and a summative questionnaire upon completion of the program. So in conclusion, as you can see, it's very, I, I put this specifically together because it's cyclic. It's constant. It's not going to stop. There might be focusing on one aspect or the other. So I want to, I want to be able to enhance mine and my peers' capability to be an educator. I want to, I want to bring up their level of educator excellence. I want them to be able to interface with the patient. I want them to be able to interface appropriately and educate appropriately and accurately. And so in, in the long run, one of our goals is to reduce the recidivism or folks returning again. Got to remember, people come back for a lot of non-emergent situations uh, to maybe that they will finally recognize that they have the skill and the capability that no, coming to the ER at 4 o'clock in the morning for a sore throat is not appropriate. Dragging your two-year-old child out at 4 a.m. in the morning when it's minus 20 degrees because they have a 100-degree temperature, which has, I can't tell you how many times happened over the past couple of months. So I want to be enabled to enable my colleagues or any other EDRN to gain the experience necessary so that the, it's a better, better interface, better experience for everyone, and also reducing um, unnecessary visits to the ER, because if you remember, the utilization is increasing because due to the lack of access and more people being either on Medicaid or uninsured. Does anybody have any questions? This is kind of me now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, I want to get one. I do have three dachshunds. I don't have this breed of dachshund. It's called a Doppler, a Dappler, I believe. Uh, he's, they're next. He's going to be the next one I adopt. Again. Does anybody have any thoughts, questions, comments? If not, I thank you all very much. <laughs> thank you.